I wanted to ask you also about general relativity. So I've heard criticism of all quantum physics from people who are concerned that there's not enough connection between these ideas and reality. I think a lot of these people just aren't aware of your work deriving quantum mechanics and general relativity from the hypergraph, which in my mind is just really compelling evidence that this project might at least have a chance of being on the right track. So could you go into your derivation of general relativity? Could you give us a high level overview of how that works? Yeah, absolutely. So we've already actually touched on a major piece of it, right? So as we said before, there's a canonical way that for a given hypergraph or a given causal graph, you can try to work out its dimension. And that's by analogy to what you might call the Hausdorff dimension of a continuous space. So if you want to work out yeah. the Hausdorff dimension of a space, you grow out a ball or some higher dimensional ball, and you look at how does its volume scale as a function of its radius. Yeah. And so if it's a flat plane, it'll grow like R squared. If it's a three-dimensional space, it'll grow like R cubed. And in general, it'll grow like R to the D in a D-dimensional space. And so you can do an analogous thing. If you've got a hypergraph, you can look at an individual node you can look at all the nodes adjacent to that node, all the nodes adjacent to those nodes, etc., and you can grow out some discrete ball of radius R, and then you look at how many nodes are contained inside that ball, and if you do a logarithmic difference estimation, you can work out the exponent of the growth rate, and from that you can derive an approximation to what would be the continuum dimension if it were a continuous space. Yeah. So there's a notion of dimension. There's also a notion of curvature, because, and this is based on some, some work from the differential geometer Alfred Gray, so in, again, in, in continuum geometries, if you look at, if you've got now a curved space and you do this construction, you grow out a small ball, what's called a geodesic ball of radius R, then yeah, so it's, it's leading order term is R to the D, but then there are subleading terms as well. And the first subleading term, which is proportional to R squared, so the dimension is contributing exponentially, this is contributing quadratically, yeah. but the first subleading term turns out to be proportional to what's called the Ricci scalar curvature which is something that appears in the Einstein equations. It's the simplest kind of curvature invariant, purely scalar quantity that you can define for an arbitrary surface. Yeah. So in, in a sense, therefore, one way you can interpret the Ricci scalar geometrically is it's telling you effectively, what is the, if you, if you look at the volume of a ball of radius R in your curved space, and you look at a ball of radius R in the corresponding flat space of the same dimension, the Ricci scalar is kind of telling you the discrepancy in the volumes of those two balls. It's giving you the subleading correction in this expansion for the dimension. And so you can apply the same construction, that, that same construction due to Alfred Gray, you can apply in the, in the hypergraph case too. Just as you can get a discrete notion of dimension, you can also extract a discrete notion of Ricci curvature. And then there's a more sophisticated construction where instead of looking at just a ball, you can look at a geodesic tube or in a causal graph, say a geodesic cone. So instead of just looking at the, the curvature at one point, you can look at two points, you can construct a geodesic tube of a certain radius that maps between them. And then again, in Gray's paper, he, okay, there's both a paper, I think, from the 1970s, but there's also a book he wrote that's rather conveniently just called Tubes, which is all about <laughs> the kind of Riemannian geometry of tubes and, 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 and curvature invariance of tubes. And so the, the idea there is you can do an analogous construction. You can look at the expansion of the volume of that tube. And again, its leading order term will be dependent on the, on the dimension of the space. And the subleading term is now dependent on the curvature, not the scalar curvature. But now because this is a directional quantity, it's actually, it's a directional curvature. Namely, it's a projection of the Ricci curvature tensor, which is the directional analog of a curvature invariant. Which is kind of the next simplest curvature invariant. And, and, and crucially, the Ricci curvature tensor and the Ricci scalar curvature are the two quantities that appear in the Einstein equations, right? The Einstein equations are telling you that some combination of the scalar curvature the curvature tensor and the metric tensor is equal to effectively the matter energy distribution of space time, the stress energy tensor. And so again, you, we can do exactly the same construction. We can get kind of these projections of the discrete Ricci curvature tensor. So from that, we should have all the pieces in place necessary to formulate essentially a discrete version of at least the vacuum Einstein field equations. So we can do that. We can work out what constraints that would correspond to. But then the interesting question is, are those constraints satisfied? And for what rules are those constraints satisfied? Yeah. And this is where it gets really quite beautiful, because it turns out those constraints are satisfied for a very general, and it turns out very natural, class of hypergraphy writing systems. So in particular, as long as your hypergraphy writing systems satisfy three axioms, three constraints, namely causal invariance, what I call asymptotic dimension preservation, and something called weak ergodicity, which we touched on yeah. earlier, but which I'll explain again, which is related to computational irreducibility. As long as those three conditions are satisfied, the Einstein field equations drop out as an inevitable mathematical consequence. 
Yeah. So to explain why that's true, okay, so we, we know what causal invariance means, right? We, yeah. we know that's just invariance of the causal structure to the updating order of the hypergraph. Weak ergodicity, which is kind of the, the most abstract of the three, that's, as I say, the, kind of the, the, the hypergraph analog of the molecular chaos assumption from molecular dynamics. And that you can encode mathematically as a very formal statement. It basically says if you take a causal graph, just as I said before, if you imagine like a, a box of molecules, you know, one way you could encode weak ergodicity is you say if you place a surface in that box, wherever you place that surface, the flux of molecules through that surface should be, should, the net flux should, should converge to zero. You can make the same statement. You can say in a causal graph, I set up a, a hyper, an arbitrary hypersurface in the causal graph, then the net flux of causal edges through that hypersurface should converge to zero. And then the remaining condition, the, the, the second of the conditions I mentioned, which is asymptotic dimension preservation, this is just the statement that the overall dimension of the space-time, as described by the causal graph, should converge to something fixed and finite, right? It shouldn't kind of diverge off to infinity. Yeah. Okay? So as long as those three conditions are satisfied, you get the Einstein field equations. And this is why. So, okay, to, 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 to really appreciate why this works, you kind of need to have some familiarity with the traditional way the Einstein field equations are derived, which is using what's called the Einstein-Hilbert action. So this is a way you can derive the Einstein field equations by means of a variational principle. You build this thing called the Einstein-Hilbert action, which is just an integral over the Ricci scalar curvature of space-time. You define that action integral over the entirety of space-time. And if you extremize that integral, if you say the variation of that integral has to be zero, and as long as you assume zero surface terms and blah, 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 under those assumptions, you get the vacuum Einstein field equations, right? So we call that Ricci scalar the relativistic Lagrangian density for gravitation. So that's where it comes from. And so it turns out that the condition of asymptotic dimension preservation is really a discrete analog of the Einstein-Hilbert action. So because, as I mentioned before, the Ricci scalar curvature and the projections of the Ricci curvature tends to appear as effectively the subleading contributions to the dimension computation. So let's imagine you're, you're, you're looking at the causal graph, and we want to make the statement that as we grow out the causal graph to infinity, that with each layer of the causal graph we add, we want it to be the case that the dimension is converging closer and closer to some fixed finite value. Yeah. In particular, we don't want it to be the case that it's diverging off to infinity. What would it mean for it to diverge off to infinity? Well, it would mean that for each, for each new layer we add to the causal graph, the in effect, the, the, the contribution of these subleading terms gets larger and larger, Yeah. right? You can think of those as being like the kind of dimension anomaly. You've got the leading order term, which is the fixed dimension we assume it's converging to, and then yeah. you've got these subleading terms. Yeah. So in particular, you don't want the contributions of these subleading terms to diverge off to infinity because then the dimension will diverge off to infinity. Yeah. So effectively, what you want to say is that if you average out the dimension anomaly across, the entire, across all the vertices in the causal graph, and across all possible projections of these cones, right, so across all possible projection directions of the discrete Ricci curvature tensor, that that average, with each variation, with each additional layer of the causal graph, that average should converge to zero. Yeah. Or the contribution should converge to zero. And so what you should be left with, once you've taken this infinite limit, is just the pure leading order dimension term that you started with. Yeah. Okay, so how would we go about encoding that? Well, if you take a projection in all possible directions of a rank 2 tensor, like the Ricci tensor, that's equivalent to what's called taking the trace. And in the context of differential geometry, that's the thing that from the Ricci tensor, if you take the trace across the two indices, you get the Ricci scalar. So taking all possible projection directions of the Ricci tensor gives you the Ricci scalar. Then you're taking the average of that Ricci scalar across all vertices in the causal graph. So you're averaging both across all projection directions and across all vertices. So effectively, you've got some discrete sum over the Ricci scalar for, for the entire causal graph. Then you're saying, okay, well, we want the variation of that, we want the increase of that with each new layer of the causal graph to converge to zero. So you're basically saying yeah. the variation of that discrete sum converges to zero. So that's the statement of asymptotic dimension preservation for the discrete case. Yeah. And implicitly there, by the way, we've used causal invariance because with each different projection direction we can choose at a given vertex, each one of those projection directions is like a different local choice of updating order. It's a different local gauge choice okay. that we've made. And so the statement that we can do that and that the causal graph remains well-defined, that we don't change the causal structure when we choose a different projection direction, is the statement of causal invariance. So we've implicitly okay. used two of the assumptions. Now, finally, we can use the third assumption to say, well, let's imagine now we grow the causal graph to infinity, 
Well, with each new layer, it becomes a better and better approximation to some continuous spacetime. Well, the weak ergodicity hypothesis then allows us to exchange that sum, that discrete sum, for an integral in the continuum limit. That's what ergodicity allows you to do. It's a sort of analytic assumption that we need in order to be able to do that. Yeah. So now our statement of asymptotic dimension preservation becomes a statement that the variation of an integral over the Ricci scalar, defined over the entire causal graph, should converge to zero. But that's exactly the statement that the Einstein-Hilbert action is extremized. Yeah. So the combination of those three assumptions gives you the vacuum Einstein field equations basically for free. Then there's a slightly more involved version of the same argument that gives you the non-vacuum field equations, where, okay, this requires yet another layer of formalism, but basically you treat contributions to the energy momentum tensor, the kind of baryonic matter contributions, you treat as being these localized topological obstructions in the hypergraph, which we may talk about later. Yeah. Those are effectively like contributions to the energy momentum tensor. But those localized topological obstructions effectively act like local increases in dimension. Because compared to the background hypergraph, they are more than averagely densely connected, if that makes yeah. sense. So if you try and measure the dimension locally in the region of one of those topological obstructions, the dimension will appear to be locally higher than yeah. it was in the surrounding hypergraph, because it's more densely connected. Yeah. And so if you run through the same argument that I described for the vacuum case, but you still want the dimension to be finite, well now, in your computation you need to account for the density of these localized topological obstructions yep. in order to make sure that your dimension calculation isn't being thrown off by these apparent local increases in dimension. Yep. So effectively, in your discrete relativistic Lagrangian density, you don't just have the Ricci scalar anymore, you also have some contribution that's proportional to a projection of the energy momentum tensor, that's proportional to some quantity that depends on the mass energy content of the hypergraph. Yep. And so then you get, subject to some assumptions about equations of state and so on, then you get the non-vacuum, the full form of yes. the Einstein-Hilbert action, and that gives you the, the, the non-vacuum Einstein field equations, including the stress energy term. So it turns out that the Einstein field equations, the, the equations of general relativity, are a very, very generic consistency condition that you get for causal invariant manifold-like hypergraphs that are not infinite dimensional. That is fantastic. Thanks for listening to The Last Theory. Join me for fresh insights into Wolfram Physics every other week. Subscribe to the free newsletter, podcast or YouTube channel at lasttheory.com. After all, this might be the most fundamental scientific breakthrough of our time.